So um, what's actually happening? So what we see, I mean, the power industry coined the phrase, but it's relevant across all the utilities, is the three Ds. We see a move towards a digitization of the network, uh, moving uh, from uh, in the part analog sensors, analog IEDs, uh, PMUs, etc., to a digitization of, of the network. Um, why is that? To make it more efficient, um, to allow you to address some of the decarbonization issues that are occurring. And at the same time, with that digitization, we're starting to see decentralization of the network. So again, talking about the power industry, that is very, very obvious. Um, you're moving from huge centralized power generation capabilities to um, distributed energy, energy resources, DERs, uh, dotted all over the place. And people, in fact, people even generating uh, using solar panels or, or wind at home. So massive decent, decentralization in that industry. We're seeing mixes across uh, and decentralization across oil, uh, water, gas uh, distribution as well. So to aid all these things, utilities need to monitor their network much, much, much more um, in a much, much more, more granular fashion. So that is resulting in a lot of uh, industrial IoT devices going out into the network. So if you look at the water uh, distribution network, there's lots of flow monitors going into the pipes now, giving really accurate um, information about the flow of the water, et cetera, which then gives you an idea of where there might be leaks, et cetera, which allows you to uh, meet your um, environmental um, and delivery requirements, similarly for other pipeline type services. Also, we see in, we're seeing for uh, security reasons in utilities, particularly um, CCTV being used to monitor uh, substations, uh, to, be, to monitor um, water distribution uh, plants, etc. So a massive deployment of new type devices required to, to collect all that information from the network. I say information at that point is raw data. It collects the raw data from the network and feeds it back to control centers that are using intelligent management systems to actually generate the knowledge that is required to become smart. And that requires a big evolution of the field area network. So you've got all those sensors that are located all across the network. They need to be able to collect the data back into a uh, communications network that can then control that back to the center of the network. So there's an evolution of their field area network, whether that be using um, 5G, like some were trying to say, or LoRa, or Wi-Fi 6, or Wi-Fi, various mobile technologies collecting that data that has to all be aggregated and put the right control center in the network. So as you can see, that communications network becomes more and more important and is central to a utility as it moves to become smart. And up to today, SDH has been the, the backbone of the, the uh, communication network, and it has been an incredibly successful um, technology. I mean, amazingly successful. It's been in, deployed for 30 years. It uh, meets all the needs and requirements and specifications to act as the comms. Unfortunately, it really isn't designed to meet the needs of this digitized world both in terms of supporting the packet transport, which is what these new uh, devices rely on, and also the capacity that is now out there in the network, you know, from the amount of data that's coming in from CCTV cameras, et cetera. And addition, it's starting to become end of life. All those people who knew how to deploy SDH are either retired or thinking about retiring. Uh, so the expertise is starting to tail off. And the products have now gone through their 20 years in the field, 25 years in the field, or we have uh, XDMs, et cetera, that have been in, in, your, in critical infrastructure networks for 20, 25 years. The end of the bathtub uh, reliability curve is we're starting to hit the back end of that curve and devices are starting to fail and there's very, very few spares out in the world. So we need to relook at that uh, communications network and what technology needs to be done. Obviously, it needs to be a packet transport technology. And as I said, that packet transport technology needs to be able to support vastly increased capacity, 
and add security. Um, when, when FCH was first put into that network, the, con the considerations around security and security of the SCADA network wasn't really at the forefront of people's minds. It certainly is now. So when we upgrade that uh, communications network, we also need to think about how we make the uh, network more secure. And what we'll see show in the rest of this presentation is how ribbons, packet and optical technology provides this high capacity, agile mission critical communications that allows that field area network to be connected to the various control centers. So what we're seeing is this move from the old traditional network based on SDH, I would call utility 1.0 to use uh, the vernacular we uh, seem to enjoy with 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, etc. So utility 1.0, it wanted rapid uh, uh, restoration and availability of the communications network, clearly, because uh, if the SCADA control network goes down, um, you can't control your network. So you've got to be able to have an always on network and that network's got to meet very, very strict performance constraints in terms of low latency, high availability, resilience, etc. However, as we move to use it, utility 2.0 and uh, with this evolution to smart, we actually add the need to be highly scalable. So as you add more and more devices into the network, you have to be able to easily scale your communications network to cope with these devices. You don't want to have to be able to pay fortunes on day one for capacity you're not using. You want to be able to increment the, the capacity as as you add more devices into the network and new technologies, et cetera. Those devices you're adding are gonna be packet devices. So the, the communications network you add has gotta be uh, capable of supporting uh, packet technology. But moreover, it's got to allow you to be able to retire and migrate off the old SDH um, communications network. So it has to provide a nice smooth evolution path from old SDH to packet transport. And then we see further, no, looking further out, there's a great need to bring the information that's happening in the OT network to the IT network to make intelligent business decisions uh, and allow those IT uh, services uh, and applications and the people work in the IT to make intelligent business decisions about how they move forward based on what the OT network is doing. And as I mentioned at the start, massive need to make the network in general, uh, increase the cyber security of the network. And those applications and new services, we're starting to see virtualization of the control centers and control and services and applications moving into the cloud and sometimes moving closer to the uh, field area network. I mean, again, I'll take, I'll choose power again because it, it, it's easy to visualize it, uh, but it, it could equally be, be water. If you think about a substation, uh, if you want to add security there, you one really great way of doing that is to put uh, all of the access security via CCTV. So you have a card, but you also have someone scanning the um, the face of the person there. So huge amount of data there. It makes sense to move the control system managing that uh, access control closer to the edge. So you're not having to pull data all the way back through the network. So you start seeing applications moving closer to the edge. The final uh, thing we're seeing, and it really does depend on the governments and the reg uh, regulation in each country, is once utilities have put really, really state-of-the-art communications network in to support their OT networks, they are extremely well-placed to use that network to offer you telco services, whether that just be offering uh, dark fiber to other uh, service providers, whether it be offering wholesaling wavelength services, um, packet services, or even providing end uh, uh, residential type services or enterprise services. There is a massive um, push and look at how they can use those resources to make extra revenue as a UTELCO. And I'll touch on that right at the very end. So what does this mean, utility 2.0? What's really happening? 
So all those devices that, that were in the network up until you know recently were really, really uh, circuit orientated type connectivity, a little bit of packet. We now see that switched round. Most of the device devices are moving to packet and circuit type devices are, are tailing off very, very rapidly. And a huge with that, a huge increase of the need to support IP, Ethernet, uh, et cetera. Um, and that means the communications network is moving towards packets to support those devices. Because there's huge capacity going into the network, we also are starting to see the need to look at the optical layer because without doubt, the cheapest cost per bit for transport is pushing everything down to the lowest level with the optical layer. So you want large capacity going large distances. You need to look at the optical layer and how you can integrate that with the packet layer to achieve the best savings. Um, and then, of course, the, 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 the layer one, you still have copper, you, uh, you still have microwave, uh, LTE and 5G now, and a large abundance of fiber in, in the WAN environment. So looking at what we're trying to modernize. As I said at the start, in the oil, gas and water space, we're looking at increased security, digitization of devices and a massive uh, data explosion to monitor stuff. We're starting to move towards uh, Utelco, where once you deploy the network, um, you're looking to evolve the, uh, what you can use that network for to offer and generate extra revenue. And then in energy, the three Gs I mentioned. So they've got this, this problem. You need to become smart, smart. Your services are mission critical, which means they've got to be reliable and secure, and they've got to deliver deterministic low latency. And in the OT side of the house, it, you know, you're managing the infrastructure, all of this mission critical in infrastructure, but your legacy network is, SD is SDH. So the obvious thing for a supporting packet is IPMPLS. However, IPMPLS as it stands cannot deliver, meet the requirements in terms of deterministic low latency. It just can't. Um, by definition, IPMPLS dynamically routes packets across the network. Um, it does not provide the determinism needed to guarantee the latency that many of your control networks require. Um, you can add in RSVPTE to traffic engineer bits of the network, but that's extremely complicated um, and uh, really doesn't match the way that you're used to operating. So there, there has to be another solution and we'll touch on that in a moment. At the same time, as you're uh, evolving that OT network, you need to be evolving the IT network and this absolutely does require uh, IPMPLS because that's perfect for all of those enterprise business services that the IT network uses and that has been optimized to provide um, transport for those type of services. So you have this dichotomy. The IT network IPMPLS well suited to OT network. It's got to be packet transport, but IPMPLS not well suited to. So we'll touch on that when we look at a few more of the drivers. So when I mentioned um, increased capacity, because it really is important to get a handle on, on what I'm talking about by increased uh, capacity. When you look at the PMUs uh, in, in a modern digitized network, you're probably looking at 15 gigabits per uh, data um, per PMU being backhaul needed to be transported back to the, um, the data center. A terabit uh, of information from smart meters. You know, nine gigabits of information from your surveillance cameras. I mean, these are just examples of a medium to large sized uh, power utility that we found working to. So in the end, you're looking at a backup every day into that data center of about six to eight terabits. That is huge capacity compared to what we had in the past. And similarly, in oil and gas, you know, you've got smart meters you know, in, in everybody's homes. That's about a terabit a day again. Similar level levels are, are in the cameras and surveillance cameras, you know, nine gig. And then the SCADA stuff and, and all of the IO that's controlling all of those IIoT devices, again, about another, another uh, gigabit. 
So you're going to get, again, a massive amount of data that needed to be backhauled into the network. So that's the, on the data side. Now I mentioned that IP MPLS isn't really um, suitable for transporting OT. Why is that? Well, if you look at this, this is this eye chart. Um, all this is really realistically saying is that the OT devices, so your, your OT network, operations technology network, needs to be highly reliable offer low latency and jitter and guarantee the level of latency and jitter and be able to in increase security. So I've got on the right hand side all the various applications that you might see in an ITOT listed and map them based on those requirements. And you can see that the IT services are uh, high capacity. In many cases uh, do not require guaranteed reliability, latency, security. All the OT ones do need that. So, for example, if you looked at um, probably the most extreme case is differential teleprotection in the power. This needs a latency of less than five milliseconds um, and less than 0.5 milliseconds in asymmetry from the forward direction of the traffic to the backwards direction of the traffic. So that needs, means you need bi-directional paths. And you need. Um, when the network fails, you need to be able to switch over very, very quickly. So basically, this is why OT is a big problem for IP MPLS. So, to capture all those requirements, we now see the need with all of the various um, utilities needing to modernize their deploying, monitoring of the remote stations, the track side, the pipe side, depending on what. What, what utility they are, CCTV everywhere, next generation SCADA, industrial IoT, and all those customer services all being connected by a field, field area network using a packet chain transport technology and optical transport technology to back all it to the applications, the SCADA control, uh, etc. So this um, Converge packet optical backbone network that, that I've shown here needs to be able to be multi service to support all of these different services being to delivered to it across many, many, many multi multiple access devices. The packet layer has to be able to be uh, deterministic so you can guarantee the performance. It has to be highly available uh, and offer very good resiliency. Because of the increased capacity, you need to be able to handle hand off um, data from the packet layer to the optical layer, because as I said, that's the lowest cost of transport. So you've got to support IP over WDM in its various forms. I'll mention that a bit later. The whole solution has to have support high capacity. And because of the complexity of this network, we need to start adding automation into it. So that's all the run up to what the requirements are upon utility networks. So now I'm going to say uh, what we offer um, in Ribbon to achieve that. So in Ribbon, we've got a converged packet and optical um, network or solutions which have been optimized for critical infrastructures. Uh, by that, I mean they're they've got um, extended life, extended temperature ranges, et cetera, high availability options. But more important or as importantly, we've got proven migration paths. So our technology, not only is it mission critical grade technology, you know, meeting those availability type requirements, we also have processes which have been proven time and time again in utility networks in the last 25 to 30 years that we've been working. We really understand the market and what's needed as we move, move forwards. As I mentioned at the start, there's a difference between the IT network and the OT network. So we support multiple variants of MPLS, we call it multi-stack MPLS, which supports both deterministic and dynamic packet transport. In this case today, we see that as IP MPLS and MPLS TP, with MPLS TP offering the deterministic transport. As we move forwards, we see a place for segment routing 
uh, given some of that determ deterministic behavior. But also for that mass capacity, we support optical networking and then we have excellent OTN and DWM solutions provided by our Apollo product range. And then in conjunction with our automation system and our um, technology, we can support the various flavors of integrating the packet and optical together. Whether that be IP over WDM, where you put a pluggable into the router, and then you just connect routers to get routers together, with the optical layer being provided between the two pluggables, whether you go down to an optical line system or you go down to a full optical transport system, whatever makes sense for the customer, we can tailor our solution to meet the right needs. And again, with the um, complexity that's starting to come into the, the network, you really need to remove the manual errors that come from manually provisioning the network and speed up being able to put correct paths in, in the network and being able to monitor the network to understand where faults might be occurring. So that's where automation from our Muse and Rain orchestrator have become really important. So just a very quick uh, touch on that multi-stack MPLS that I mentioned. Um, with that multi-stack um, MPLS, we're able, able to support MPLS TP, IPM over MPLS segment routing, a technology called Flexi that I'll mention later, those IP over WDM uh, technologies I mentioned. So with that, you get the ability to provide that multi-service support that I mentioned on that edge of that network. With that multi-service support, you can support all of the legacy technologies you support today. You can support the new uh, packet technologies that are being deployed, and so the PMUs, the IEDs, etc., into that network. And it can support, uh, has the agility to support what is likely to be coming down the pipe in the future. Bear in mind, this is a critical infrastructure network. Once your customers have deployed it, it is likely, almost certain, to remain in the network for 20 years plus. So it better have the ability and agility to support what's coming down the pipe. And as I mentioned, these then obviously support the ability to do the deterministic and the dynamic transport and optimize across the IP and optical layers. Now I'm not going to do a product presentation here because there's no, there's not enough time. We can spend a lot more time talking about the individual products, but we have a, a full uh, product portfolio within our packet domain, being able to support all those high availability needs. Uh, with our Neptune AR1000 series routers. Um, we've recently added a 1012D and a 1015 to that portfolio at the edge, so you can support extra types of capabilities or needs. The point is here that we have the form factors that are required for each given need. So we will tailor what is the right product to meet your customer's needs. So certain form factors are required for certain customer types. A great example uh, of this um, is the new product range products we've introduced, as I mentioned, the 1012D and the 1015. So the 1012D is a dim rail mountable um, device. Um, as you can see, it's extremely, it's extremely small, as you can might imagine, it's a dim, dim rail device, but it still supports 40, that's right, 32 gig of non-blocking uh, switching capacity. It's temperature hardened as you require in these sort of um, networks. So really, really for that, right at the edge in those applications where you need that sort of device. Similarly, the 1015 uh, is our first uh, product that is uh, supports uh, fanless um, deployment. All the other products uh, we have have fans in. This is our first product um, that supports a, a fanless because certain applications are so re in such remote locations that having a fan, if the, even if the, the fan fails and the redundant fan fails, um, it's not good enough. You need to be able to operate for long periods of time with no fan. So this is our first device in that, that space, really optimized around layer two um, uh, uh, connectivity. And then 
you might ask why I'm, why do I, I, I want a high performance routing type capabilities um, that the, the Neptune XDR2000 series uh, provides? Well, with all that huge amount of capacity in the network, um, you're starting to see the need to support more and more um, high capacity links between the routers. I mean, 100 gig uh, connectivity between routers is becoming pretty normal for the medium to large sized uh, utility customers uh, we're talking to. And we're seeing the need for 100 gig connectivity um, in that backhaul network being pretty common commonplace. At that point, you need to be able to support higher capacity routers and that's where the, the, XD, the XDR2000 series type routing approach um, um, fits. Now again different uh, customers have different needs so we have a mix of different form factors for this. So for example the 2100 and the 2400 here are fixed format uh, fixed configuration, um, non-modular type product. That works well for some operators. The 2300 is a modular box where you, you can uh, grow capacity by moving uh, matrix cards uh, in and out of the box. So again, the key here is we can work with you to tailor the right solution to meet the actual needs of your customers today and as they are looking to evolve to go forwards. So I did mention, and I, I would talk about um, deterministic packet transport uh, and uh, MPSTP. The reason why I've dedicated a bit of uh, a slot of time for MPSTP because it is just so important in the utility customer uh, space. As I mentioned, they're used to using SDH. That is what they feel comfortable. Communication services is not their core business. So you need to be give, given some uh, transport technology that they feel comfortable with. But SDH isn't going to cut it as we move forward for the reasons I mentioned before. It is optimized for circuit um, style uh, connectivity. It is not optimized for transporting packet. It doesn't have the capacity. Uh, we're running out of spares and the lifetime of the products is getting old, etc. Loads of reasons um, why SDH really doesn't cut it anymore. Also, environmentally, it takes a huge amount of power for the amount of capacity it transports. By switching to a packet transport device, you can reduce power, uh, the power by over 95%. I mean, it's a huge saving in cost. Same with footprint. What used to be a whole a whole rack is now one single shelf. Massive savings in space, if that's important to the end customer. So lots of drivers to move to packet transport. IPMPLS doesn't cut it. Uh, you can add RSVPTE, but it adds complexity to the network, complexity to your operation staff. And MPLS TP was invented precisely for the need of transporting services based on SDH using circuit emulation to map those SDH services onto a packet transport network. This was the purpose of MPSTP, it's what it's built for. And that means that MPSTP was built to have transport like ONM, which means anyone using the communications network which is SDH today will feel very, very comfortable with the PMs, the PM, the alarms, the fault notifications they're getting. The ability to set up bi-directional paths, as I said, is absolutely essential for some types of services, teleprotection being one. And that's how you do it with SDH. Again, your operators will feel very, very comfortable with using it. It's a centralized uh, management from a centralized uh, management system again like they do today and it with that guarantee of um, deterministic um, latency time and variation in latency across the network I the um, timing and sync that you rely on with SDH is maintained using 1588 version 2 or sync key so you really really can still use the timing from your SDH network 
across across the, the network. And then, of course, absolutely key to availability with M plus STP, you get all of the um, requirements you, you had with SDH. In fact, we can if you, if you set it up right, you can protect and switch quicker than you can in SDH at sub 10 milliseconds, but it absolutely guarantees sub uh, 50 milliseconds plus all the protection schemes, uh, et cetera. So Ribbon has been working with MPSTP as one of the early advocates and early adopters of MPSTP back in the um, mid 2000s. And we've deployed this across many, many, many utility customers very, very successfully. So we're great advocates for this because we believe it meets the need of your customers. But it's not just us that say this. If you go to the Seagri Green Book, they say MPSTP is field proven to meet the latency and jitter requirements for teleprotection. Um, so if it can meet that for teleprotection, it can meet it for any other service requirements because teleprotection is the most onerous type of service. service. And then if you go to North America, it's not just Europe, they're saying MPSTP offers you know, several benefits. It's a truly reliable layer two type of service delivery bi-directional LSPs and centralized provisioning you're used to. So absolutely fundamental. At this point in time, M plus DP is what you should be pu pushing to your customers with circuit emulation to take those legacy IOT devices or IOT or IEDs and back all those across a packet network as you're adding in the packet devices at the same time. As we move forward over the next 5, 10, 15 years, it may be that uh, segment routing traffic engineers becomes more proven in, in these highly critical infrastructures. And we start to see a migration from uh, MPLS TP to segment routing. As I said before, we support multi stack MPLS, what we call multi stack MPLS. So that means we can easily evolve from MPLS TP to segment routing TE when and if your customers are ready to make that move. The other area I mentioned um, in passing is the ability to be able to support packet and optical together. Depending on the service needs of your customers, depending on the capacity, um, we tailor the solution based on what's best for them. It could be uh, what we've called here I IP over WDM Direct Connect, where you just put pluggables in the routers and that gives you your optical layer. Or it could be that you put a, a grey optics pluggable in your MPT and it transports the, the data over an optical line system. Or you could e even indeed um, have the IP layer separate from the optical layer. And again, the grey optics into a full blown optical layer with transponders and um, OTN and RODEM. The point is, we don't have an axe to grind on any of these approaches and we'll work with you to work out what's best for your end customer. And then I mentioned about IT o OT convergence. The IT network has a certain set of requirements. The OT network has a different set of requirements. I think we, we got that from earlier on. But there is a growing need and desire in your customers to bring those networks together. So they don't want to invest in two completely separate networks. It's just it's expensive. It doesn't meet their operational needs. And you're starting to see IT. Sorry, the uh, IT devices and services needing to gain information from the OT network to help make uh, uh, business decisions. In the energy field, that might be energy trading, for example. So there's a technology which was de designed for 5G, which is absolutely brilliant at doing this. So this was um, called network slicing in uh, 5G terms. The transport network slicing, as it turns out, is absolutely perfect for the um, uh, mission critical businesses, utilities because you're able to take one set of physical network resources and allocate it different services, providing absolutely guaranteed segregation between each of those slices. So you can run 
your IT network on one hard slice and you can run your OT network on another hard slice. So by hard slice, I mean real guaranteed separation. There's no way anything happening to traffic in one hard slice can impact traffic on another hard slice. The sort of technology used for hard slicing is either separate fibers, very expensive, separate wavelengths, not quite as expensive, but can, you know, when you consider a single wavelength can carry 1.2 terabits of information, still quite expensive. You're going to underutilize that network massively, that, that uh, wavelength capacity. Or there's a technology called Flex E, which then splits the, the network into the hard slices across the IP layer and hands that across the network. So Flex E is very, very good for the uh, utility business. And once you've created a hard slice, you can run normal type soft slices across each of those hard slices. So within that IT network, you might support different levels of services that have different requirements. Each of those can use standard QoS, packet QoS to achieve um, the soft slicing. Similarly, within the OT network, if you want to split even further, segregate the, between the hard slices, you can achieve that um, using the QoS type uh, activities to give you those soft slices. David, so, just yeah. a quick, quick one from the audience. With the evolution from MPLSTP to segment routing, th does this require new hardware or just config? Uh, it's just config. Yeah, the multi-stack MPLS allows you uh, to do that. It, it's, a, it's a software change in the uh, way that um, the signaling works across the network. And we can do a session on, on segment routing uh, for the audience if, or the individuals if they want uh, more detail on, on segment routing. But the short answer is it's, a, it's just a, a config change. Very well. And just and just to remind the partners that joined us a bit late, you have the Q&A button. Use it. I'm getting your questions and we will touch everything at the end in the Q&A in the Q &A part. Go ahead, David. OK, so that's actually a great point. I'm going to summarize now. I pulled out two of the key areas, MPLS, TP, I, um, IP over optical. So with Ribbon, you have a whole portfolio with the right form factors to meet your needs. We have the technology of MPLS TP. We're probably the leading or one of the leading vendors in doing circuit emulation using MPLS TP to take those old legacy SDH services and map them onto a packet network. So we're able to provide that risk-free risk, risk -free translation. It's been field proven many, many, many times in utility mission critical business applications. And we can choose the right migration path timeline for you to meet your customers' needs. And there's a whole set of processes that we do where we've been proven to achieve that. In addition, I mentioned about security. We work with best in class uh, security um, uh, houses to take what our solution and add that security that you need. That might be um, point of access security right at the edge of the network using um, SCADA anomaly uh, detection. It might be the industry uh, standard um, or even the the um, firewalls, I, IDSs, IPSs that your customers recommend. We can integrate with those and our professional services organization have and do do that right the way through to um, making sure we integrate with the right SEM that's being used in your customer. So the, the point here is five, six years ago, we tried to do this ourselves, but it became very, very quickly apparent that it's best to allow you and us to work together to choose best in class resources for those firewalls, SCADA anomaly detection SEMs, rather than try and do it in ribbon, because we, we will never be able to pick the most state of the art one of those, you need specialists in the field. So absolutely key to work in an open ecosystem with these guys to make sure that we can tailor the security solution to meet their needs. And then 
The platforms, I said right at the start, have been optimized for criti uh, critical infrastructure type deployments in terms of uh, form factors, in terms of uh, meeting the right requirements and standards, in terms of being able to be in the network for the period of time that's required, 10, 15 years or more, which means they need to have this multi-stack MPLS, for example, which gives the future-proof nature that's required if you're going to be in the network for so long. So it's easy for me to just talk technology, technology. I'm going to spend two slides, I, I believe, on um, how those certain types of technology were used in actual customers. I'm not going to mention the customer names. Um, some of you will recognize these customers because they're your customers. Some of you won't. Uh, generally, uh, critical infrastructures don't like to release the names of their communications network. It doesn't help with security. If you know what's there. So anyway, the first one here it happened to be a port authority. And of course, you're communicating what's going on in, in those networks. You really need with those safety critical devices in the ports to have field proven pa packet um, transport processes. And we've, they used our MPS TP technology to give them their high availability deterministic packet transport network that they required. And they're very, very happy with this and they're trying to roll it out further across their various ports. Then I mentioned about network slicing. Uh, there's a large utility in, in Western Europe who are actually deploying uh, network slicing or, or in the utility speak, network segre segregation to achieve. The exact need we mentioned about ITOT convergence. And they're basing that on using SRTE, Flex Algo, and Flex E, and then MPSTP to give that deterministic uh, transport. So, again, it wasn't just me saying this about slicing. We have, I say, a very large utility network uh, in Western Europe who is absolutely using um, network slicing in part of their solution. Um, then, another in, in I'd say, Central, Central Europe, a, a big power company. Um, they are one of the, I was, I was going to say dozens, but it's probably hundreds of customers that we've got who are using circuit emulation in conjunction with MPSTP uh, to migrate their network. And they're concurrently supporting for their less onerous services. They're so using IP MPSTP, TP, they're using IP MPS for their transport. For the more onerous type services that really need deterministic behavior, they're using MPSTP. And as I said, if you put an action device in in the network, it can run IP MPLS. It can also run MPLS TP concurrently. And if you need to, it can stitch IP MPLS and MPLS TP together. What it can also do, and this may not, you think is not relevant to your utility customers, because uh, this is a super large mobile network operator in India. Why is that relevant to utilities? Well, the utility, so the, the, the relevance here, as I said, about not only can it stitch IP MPLS and MPS TP together, this uh, company initially deployed 15,000 nodes or more using MPS TP. Now, seven, eight years later, they want to move that network to IP MPLS. We've migrated the whole network in, in the field, running live traffic, from MPLS TP to IP MPLS, same boxes, no forklift, just a software change. So this is proving that multi-stack approach in a real network running re real live um, traffic. And we're into working in the core of the network with Cisco and Nokia type routers that continue to work seamlessly. So that really gives you that agility and that future proof nature you mentioned. And it actually leads back to the question about segment routing. Once you've got the IP MPLS in the network, you can then look at how segment routing and the signaling across to make the segment routing work in the way you want. Then very, very briefly, I did mention in that last bullet at the front that um, once you've got all this network deployed, this really high capacity optical fibers, and then as I said, each with, with our, our world leading optical technology and I'm not just saying that we really are the first people in the market to be able to deploy 1.2 terabits uh, on an optical fiber, sorry, on an on a, uh, optical wavelength and you can support 48 
wavelengths in a fiber. Once you've got all that capacity deployed at the optical layer, all the smarts deployed at the packet layer, that's really great for your, your OT and your IT network, but you've probably got spare capacity that you could use for other things. You've certainly got the smarts in your network you can use for other things. So we're starting to see a big increase in the demands for what how can I use this network for? As I mentioned at the start, it may depend on regulation. If the government has paid for you to deploy your customer to deploy the network, telcos get pretty upset if you uh, then use that network to compete with them because they say that's unfair competitive advantage. So it can depend on the regulation. But that said, there is great opportunity to move into offering new telco type services. This could be within your customer's own um, business space. So we're starting to see a number of customers who have migrated their OT networks. They're running happily, but they've got um, sister companies who are close by who need to migrate their OT service onto new communications network. They, whatever reason, they don't have the capabilities or they don't want to do it themselves. It's not in their business model. And instead of going to a service provider to provide that uh, communications network, we're seeing critical infrastructures acting as co-ops, offering to, to um, provide the communications network for other OT, other customers that have OT networks. I mean, this is particularly common in North America, but we're starting to see, see um, examples of this outside of uh, North America. Similarly, and as I say, critical inf infrastructure opportunities are, you will have that communications network, it's in the right place. You can start helping with the investment that's going around smart cities. Then if you move on to true new telco services, um, where you're acting as a service provider, and this really depends how far down the line you want to go because uh, it gets more and more complicated the closer to the end customer you get. The first thing you can start to see, well, what you're even seeing today, um, you've got equipment rooms, you've got a space where where telcos can put their own equipment in. That's a little bit of revenue, not a great deal of revenue, but it, it's one way of getting your foot in the door. The next step is you can start to offer uh, wholesale services. This might be dark fiber, but again, given how much capacity you can put on, on a dark fiber, you'd be better off offering lit managed uh, wavelengths. But you then need to have operational skills in doing that and experience in doing that. What we're starting to see is a great, a lot of uh, request or inf interest from mobile network operators to provide the backhaul for their 5G networks. Um, the reason for this is most utilities have the way leaves that required to dig alongside their um, deployed deployed uh, infrastructure. So you've got the way leaves where you, you can get in, you're used to doing that, and you can reach some very, very inaccessible type locations, which is where the master. <laughs> um, so you have a great uh, synergy being able to wholesale uh, capabilities to MNOs and that might as I say be dark fiber it might be lit fiber it might be um, managed services where you're actually managing the 5G back all network at, at the packet layer level that depends on where you want to go on the business model and we could speak, speak for hours on this and then similarly as you get closer to the end customer either you can offer enterprise services either as the back all uh, transport network or even put in an access network at the end to, to offer enterprise services. And similar, similarly with residential broadband. The point is there are many, many opportunities for you to use this communications network. Once it's there, generate you new revenue, new opportunities. And many, many utilities are doing this. So we have a lot of experience in taking you, walking you with you as you move from utility do you tap telco or different arms of your business do so? So in short, we work with you to provide a tailorable solution for your utilities customers. It's based around our three uh, technology areas, 
our packet transport network, which is both dynamic and deterministic, offers both types that are required in mission critical businesses. And this optical networking that I mentioned, ranging from IP over WDM with pluggables through to full optical systems before um, deployed with Apollo. And then the whole lot is automated using our Muse uh, domain orchestration suite. With that, we can provide our, your utility customers with risk-free modernization of their network today, but then continuous evolution as new technologies, new business models move forwards. Those solutions are, as I said, tailorable, but they're scalable and scale as your customers require them. We can provide the guaranteed performance requirements needed for OT. The products are uh, mission critical business optimized to meet the security uh, and standards required. And it gives you the framework for UTELCO evolution. So I know that is a real whistle stop tour through what we can do. Uh, if you want, if for those of you who are attending NLIT in Paris next week, we will be there, I will be there, plus a number of our other experts will, will be on the booths uh, and let. So for those of you attending Enlit in Paris next week, please come and talk to us. We can go through a lot more detail. We can show you the product. We can show you how that automation system works. We've got a live setup for that. So please, if you're there, come down. We can go in a lot, lot more detail. That said, we have a few minutes now where you can ask some questions about what I have um, uh, presented today. And then even after today, please feel free to send myself or, or your um, contacts within Ribbon um, questions about the uh, any questions you might have. Beautiful. So you and just, yeah, yeah. And just talking about Enlit, you forgot mentioning that we have um, an hour of glass of champagne during Enlit. OK, November 29th. 5 to 6 p.m. at our booth. Some champagne with David Stokes and and our other experts. But but let's cover the let's cover the uh, question that we received during this session. So the first one is, what does automation help with? So I, I, as I mentioned as I was going through, basically with automation, it covers the whole gamut of service lifestyle. A life cycle, sorry, lifestyle be interesting, but a uh, life cycle. So when you're first um, engineering the network, it provides you all the planning and engineering tools you need to set up that network. And that's based on real information. It's live connection to the real network. Then as you provision the network, if you do that manually, which you can do, um, the problem with manual provisioning is it's very prone to errors. Um, it's very easy to make, you know, with long um, addresses, long port names, it's very easy to make mistakes and you end up doing misprovisioning, which means then you have to go back and do it again. Very time consuming. With automation, you can just put connect A to B. It sets up the path across the packet layer. If there's an optical layer associated with that, it'll also set up the path across the optical layer. So very quickly, it's just, connect A to B with this capacity meeting these requirements, it does it. With the automation as well, you can set up templates, so you don't even need to um, say with this capacity, with this uh, performance requirements, you just say A to B, template A, boom. And as you can see, that massively reduces the amount of time you spend provisioning. Your, your people doing that can spend more time making sure that your networks are working correctly. Then, once the network is up and running, um, it allows you to monitor the network. So if there's any faults happening in the network, it allows you to rapidly identify the root cause of the failure uh, and where and how to rectify that. So at the optical layer, we have embedded um, OTDR and we monitor the uh, performance of the network so you can very rapidly a identify outages potential outages as well where there are outages it can use a gis system to pinpoint within three meters as to where a fiber has failed absolutely critical if you're trying to you know, send trucks out to fix 
folks to know which manhole or which location to go to. Um, so those are just a few of the, the things that automation brings. But please, if you're at Analyte, come and look at our live demo of automation system. If you're not, ask, ask for a live demo of the Muse automation system. It is very, very powerful. OK, David, another one. Uh, some utilities are looking at private LTE for field network to control center. Any, do you have any quick thoughts on how NPT products can integrate with private LTE solution? So that uh, all depends on uh, how, how you're con configuring the network. If you're buying your own LTE uh, type solution, um, one of those really large operators I mentioned, the one in India, uh, but across the globe, uh, we've built our uh, Neptune product, so it's fully um, set up to support mobile backhaul, both for 3G, 4G and 5G. So we have all the instrumentation, all of the technology required uh, to provide uh, the backhaul of an LTE network all the way to wherever the control center is, is located. It's normal business for Neptune to do that. So in short, if you've got that private, private LTE network, we can provide the backhaul, the mobile uh, across the network to your control center. We do it, we've done it, we do it, we've done it in many, many customers. Okay, let's do the last one quickly. Why is packet optical multi-layer important? Um, why is it important? So I mentioned how it could be done, but why might you want to do it? Um, so I'm going to talk about understanding it in the multi-layer. You couldn't, in the old days, and I mean today by the old days, um, you'd have separate people or you consider each layer separately, not as, as an integrated whole. So when you're setting up your network to be highly available, you'd set up, say, one plus one protection in your optical layer. But then when you set up your IP layer, the IP layer has no knowledge of what's going on in the optical layer. So you then set up that uh, IP layer, transport layer, so it offers the protection you require. So in reality, now you really underutilize your network because you run protection both at the packet layer and the optical layer. And worse than that, it might not, because one might conflict with the other, you might not actually meet your um, reliability uh, needs. So when you put them together, so you've got multi-layer IP optical, again, this is your automation system, it can understand the IP layer, it can understand the um, optical layer so it can make sure you set up things like protection correctly across the network the same applies for things like um, um, latency or uh, path computation if the packet layer is not aware of what the actual underlying optical layer is it might think the lowest cost path is between router a and router c but it might be that the optical layer routes that you know, thousands of kilometers for some weird reason. So to really understand when you do that path computation, you need to be able to understand both the IP and the optical layers in a multi-layer way. I mean, that's a very short answer to that. Is it, the packet layer is reliant on the optical layer for many, many of its, um, to meet many of its requirements. So it needs to be aware of it. Good, thank you, David. And um, I think that we're done. I can just mention that we're going to invite you again. Uh, it's going to be December 12th for another session, right? Another live session with you uh, talking about rail. Um, so that's one one opportunity to meet you again. Again, as you mentioned, we can meet you at Elite Europe, Paris, uh, 28th to 30th of uh, November. And I think um, that we please, can, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, and please come in if you are there to come and share the champagne. I don't want to drink it all myself. I, I'm too old to drink that much champagne. Beautiful. OK, David, thank you for your time. See you again uh, December 12th and uh, during and late. And thank you all partners for joining us. See you soon. Bye bye. Bye bye.